Ja, ein herzliches Willkommen nochmal von meiner Seite. Ich bin nochmal dabei, der Fabi von den äh, Students und von der Public Climate School Orga. Ich freue mich unglaublich auf diesen super tollen Vortrag Changing Seas, How Climate Change Impacts Our Oceans and Why We Should Care mit Anna Fiesinger. Ähm, Anna äh, hat die letzten Public Climate Schools auch mitorganisiert. Sie studiert Meeresbiologie Biologie an dem Geomar in Kiel und ist dann nebenbei auch bei den Students in Kiel aktiv. Und deswegen freue ich mich unglaublich, dass du, Anna, heute da bist und uns ein bisschen was zu Changing Seas erzählst. Und das Ganze wird jetzt in Englisch stattfinden. Anna hält den gesamten Vortrag auf Englisch. Und ihr könnt auch wieder Fragen über Tweetback stellen. Dazu wird gleich nochmal hier äh, ein Link erscheinen im, im Bild. Und wir schicken den nochmal im YouTube-Chat. Und am Ende werden wir dann nochmal ein, zwei Fragen an Anna weitergeben. Das dann wiederum auf Deutsch. Und ja, wir freuen uns unglaublich, Anna. Du kannst gerne loslegen. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Fabi, for this introduction. Um, yes, I will talk about how our oceans change with climate change, how climate change impacts our oceans, what role the oceans play in the climate system and why we should care. First of all, I want to start with some basics. Um, most of you probably know that about three quarters of Earth are covered by our oceans. Um, about 90% of living species actually live in or depend on our oceans. And still more than 80% of them are unexplored, which um, can easily be explained if we look at the average depth of the oceans, which is about four kilometers. Um, the deepest point in our oceans is actually the Mariana Trench with about 11 kilometers. And um, because the deep sea is a very hostile environment for our ocean, uh, for us humans, um, but also for a lot of other species because there's, um, yeah, there's a great pressure. There's almost no light um, or even no light at all. Um, and so only about four humans, I think, have uh, so far managed to go all the way down to 11 kilometers. And um, yeah, so we can understand why a lot of our oceans, which is deep sea, um, is unexplored. But what we do know is that without our oceans, we wouldn't have life because they regulate our climate, they feed us in many parts of the world, and they provide us with oxygen. Actually, about half of the world's oxygen come from phytoplankton, which are photosynthesizing algae <laughs> in, um, in our oceans, and about the other half comes from the vegetation on land. Now, I want to stress that um, when we look at climate change, we cannot look at the different compartments of our climate system um, separately. We have to look at all of them together because they all um, interact with each other. And I want to look at the ocean climate feedback today. So how the ocean impacts our climate. Um, the famous um, climate scientist, Mujib Latif from Geomar, um, wrote in one of his books that the chaotic nature of weather is in a way put in its place by the ocean. Um, the coupling between atmosphere and ocean basically determines the climate from season to season, but also from decade to decade, from century to century and on even longer timescales. The ocean does this by capturing and storing heat through advection in the surface oceans. And the ocean transports this heat. This is done by the global conveyor belt, which is illustrated by this little sketch on the left. Um, the, um, the surface currents are what you see here in red and the deep water currents are what you see here in blue. They are, um, it, this is a fairly simplified sketch, but it portrays the message that the overturning circulation of our oceans is massive and um, all ocean basins are basically interconnected. The evaporation of surface water actually leads to a cooling of the overlying air masses, which um, also Mujib Latif has um, yeah, stated in his book as basically like an air conditioning of our Earth. Furthermore, um, the ocean has a low albedo. The albedo is the property of a surface to reflect sunlight. Um, and, and for example, ice has a very high albedo. So that means it reflects almost all of the sunlight, whereas darker colors like our oceans 
um, absorb sunlight. And so they absorb and then also store the energy that is generated by sunlight. One example how we humans are impacted by the ocean climate feedback are tropical storms. Um, in this sketch here on the left, you can see that tropical storms, as is said in their name, occur mostly in the tropics. Um, the names that are given for them are different in each part of the world. So hurricanes in the Atlantic or in the East Pacific, um, no, <laughs> tropical storms in the Atlantic or the East Pacific are called hurricanes. In the West Pacific, we call them typhoons. And in the Indian Ocean, we call them cyclones, but they're basically all um, mostly the same. They're all generated in the same way. I don't want to go too much into detail how they're formed. Um, I just want to stress that the ocean surface temperature needs to be at least 26.5 degrees for tropical storms to actually occur. Um, in that turn, the evaporation is also high when the ocean surface temperature is so high. And so we can imagine when this is um, a prerequisite for, for tropical storms to actually form, when ocean temperatures rise due to climate change, we can imagine that tropical storms become much more severe. And this is the first point where I want to stress that, um, that the climate, that climate change, whenever we look at climate change, it's a social justice issue, as most of you probably know, um, because the parts of the world that have contributed, contributed the least to climate change are actually the ones that are most affected, as here, for example, in the tropics. Another thing that our oceans do in terms of climate is they actually absorb CO2. They actually capture CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, as you can see here uh, on the left by this graph, we all know um, in the last century, we've accumulated CO2 in the atmosphere. The emissions are steadily rising, but from this CO2 that we actually emit, about 25% get taken up by the oceans, about another 25% get taken up by the vegetation on land, and only about half of it remain in the atmosphere. This means if we imagine we didn't have an ocean, the CO2 um, content of the atmosphere would actually be much higher. The CO2 is taken up through different processes. I don't want to go into too much detail because um, it will get very chemical. Um, but um, it's taken up by chemical processes in the surface water, which is called the solubility cycle. And it also gets taken up by the phytoplankton that I mentioned earlier, the photosynthesizing algae in the surface oceans. They photosynthesize and so they take up CO2 um, and produce oxygen. This is called the biological cycle. They, when they take up CO2, and then they die, they actually transport the, CO, the captured CO2 down um, into the water column. So the CO2 actually sinks down out of the surface ocean. When CO2 is taken up by our oceans, there is a problem, however, because it dissolves in the water. It dissolves to carbonic acid. Um, it further dissolves to bicarbonate ions and then into hydrogen and carbonate ions. And this is a problem because when hydrogen ions in the oceans rise, so like when the, the amount of them rises, the pH drops. And the pH is a measure of how acidic or how basic um, a solution is. And so when the pH drops, the more acidic it becomes. The carbonate ions that um, are produced, they actually bind again with some of the hydrogen ions that um, are released through this process which one could think is a good thing, but it unfortunately isn't because these carbonate ions um, are very necessary for organisms that have their shells formed from calcium carbonate that are mollusks like mussels and snails, for example, or um, corals that form their skeleton out of calcium carbonate. The change in the surface pH um, is predicted to <clears throat> be about 0.5. So like it will drop by 0.5 by the end of this century, which doesn't sound like much at first, 
But um, if we look at this curve, we can understand that it is a lot because last year, um, on average, the pH in the global ocean has actually already dropped by about 0.1. And this um, equivalates to 20 to even 30% more acidic waters. By the end of this decade, it's predicted that cold water corals, for example, will actually already reduce their calcification because of the acidification. Um, many other organisms, as you can see on this graph, will eventually also be affected by reduced growth, for example, such as in oysters or shell dissolution, such as in pteropods. By the end of this century, <clears throat> um, we assume in the worst case scenario, that the pH will actually already drop by 0.45. And this um, translates into 100 to 150% more acidification of the ocean waters. There's different studies that show, um, <clears throat> that show the impacts of ocean acidification on certain species. Um, for example, um, the more acidic water has been shown to lead to a hearing loss in certain species of fish, such as clownfish, for example. Um, and more acidic water has actually um, already been shown to have a reduced capacity to dampen sound. And the ocean is actually a fairly loud place due to ship traffic, drilling, even waves or rain. And if the ocean becomes more loud, this could potentially lead to more whale beachings because they, um, they are dependent on their hearing for orientation. When we talk about climate change, we of course have to talk about the elephant in the room, which is the temperature rise in, in the oceans also. Um, on the graph here on the left, you can see that um, the average surface, temp surface temperature is projected to change um, as the climate changes, of course. By the end of the century, um, when we look at the worst case scenario, which is RCP 8.5 from the IPCC, um, we look at, um, at an, a surface temperature change of four degrees or even six degrees more than we already have. The graph at the top shows you the sea ice extent in the Northern hemisphere. Um, it's looking at the month of September because the month of September um, is always the month where there's the least sea ice. Um, and you can see that even by 2050, in the worst case scenario, we already, we're already looking at almost no sea ice extent. And this is a problem in the Arctic, for example, um, because if there's no sea ice, there's a whole ecosystem that depends on the sea ice. The lower right graph um, shows the mean sea level rise globally. Um, this has a very, very high uncertainty, um, but still we're looking at a potential sea level rise of one meter um, globally by the end of the century, which means that, um, and this is an average, which, which means that in certain areas, it will be more than one meter. And this is especially bad for coastlines. Um, a rising temperature in the ocean actually um, also leads to a process that means that we'll have less CO2 that is taken up by our oceans because warmer waters um, lose the capacity to take up gas at some point. So when they warm, um, yeah, eventually the, the ocean will take up less and less CO2. And this, of course, is a problem because this will in turn increase the CO2 content in the atmosphere and then in turn increase the global temperatures and even more rapidly. And this is actually, or it's been shown that it's an exponential curve, so it will become more rapid. There's impacts on different um, organisms also. Um, I'm just going to stress a few here. Um, and it's been shown that muscle development in certain species is impacted when the temperatures of the oceans rise. Many organisms are forced to migrate poleward, for example, because their tolerance limit 
um, will be exceeded. So like if they have a certain temperature um, range that they like to live in, if this is exceeded, then many organisms either die or they're forced to migrate, for example. This brings me to the second part of my talk. I want to talk about corals. Um, they are my favorite animal in the seas, um, but also they're the most threatened, unfortunately. And this is because both ocean acidification and seawater um, temperature rise impact these species. Um, when we talk about corals, we have to distinguish if we're talking about cold water corals or tropical warm water corals. Cold water corals um, live up to 2000 meters in depth. So that's why they're also sometimes called deep sea corals. Um, they can actually tolerate temperatures as low as four degrees. Whereas warm water corals actually live in shallow depths um, up to 50 meters and their temperature range is from about 18 to 29 degrees, but this also varies within species. I want to focus on tropical warm water corals today. Um, their range, as is also said in the name, is the tropical zone, because also, of course, their temperature limit. Um, before I go into detail what, um, how they're impacted by temperature rise and by ocean acidification, I want to Yes, I want to show what a coral actually is, um, because corals are actually animals. Um, I think a lot of people don't know this. Um, they form a calcium carbonate skeleton, um, and they are made up of tiny polyps, of hundreds of thousands of tiny little polyps. Um, there is living tissue that links these polyps together and that then form colonies, which is one coral as you would basically see it. And they can have many different forms, like they can look like little brains or they can look like branch branches um, or even plates. The polyps have um, yeah, like a little mouth and an intestine, which is called the gastrovascular cavity um, because they feed with their nematocysts, those are stinging cells. Um, they capture their prey, which are mostly plankton. So like little, um, yeah, swimming um, algae or even little, um, yeah, little animals. So they capture them and then transport them to their mouth. But what they also do is um, they photosynthesize, but they don't photosynthesize themselves. Um, their symbionts do. Those are little algae called dinoflagellates that live inside the coral tissue. And they're called symbionts because this is a symbiosis. A symbiosis means that it's a mutual relationship for the, both of the partners. Um, so like it's, it's positive for both of them. Because the polyp um, provides the symbionts with organic material and also shelter inside of their tissue. And the symbionts provide the polyp with nutrients and energy from their photosynthesis. And corals form reefs, as most of you probably know. Um, they form these because they grow next to each other, on top of each other, or on top of dead coral fragments, for example. And they can form these huge three-dimensional structures, as we can even see from space, like here in Australia on the Great Barrier Reef or this barrier reef in New Caledonia. They can also form funny little um, structures like here um, on a reef in Australia as well. Coral reefs are actually the most diverse ecosystems in our oceans um, because many organisms depend on them. So they live in them or within them or from them. Um, actually, we live from them too. Um, I will stress this with this little, um, yeah, this little sketch that I made here. Um, imagine we have a coral reef ecosystem. Many different coral species live together with um, other little animals that live inside them. Um, or for example, fish that come into the reefs to lay their eggs because there it's more sheltered. 
um, then we have many associated reef organisms. Those are algae, those are zooplankton, those are other fish or higher predators as is indicated here by the dolphin. Um, and they all somehow feed on each other. Um, and so they're all basically dependent upon each other. So some species, like I said, live inside the reef. They either live from the reef because they feed on certain species that live within the reef and so on and so forth. But reefs also provide ecosystem services to us humans because um, especially in um, yeah, coastal regions, people depend on these reefs um, because like I said, they're like a shelter for fish. And so a lot of, um, yeah, there's more fish um, production or more fish diversity where there's a coral reef. And since we live off of fish a lot, especially in, in coastlines, um, yeah, they provide this ecosystem service for us. But they are also um, a shelter for us basically because through their three-dimensional structure, they're able to um, break waves basically. So in tropical, when tropical storms occur, for example, um, they're able to um, yeah, basically dampen the effects on the coastlines. So when we talk about temperature rise, we have to talk about the main cause that is killing most corals, um, especially in recent years, which is coral bleaching. This occurs because when a coral is stressed and the symbionts inside the tissue are stressed, the symbionts start producing toxins and then the host expels the symbiont. But the symbiont is actually what gives the coral its color. And so they look all white as here in the middle um, because they lose their color, they lose their symbionts. When they lose their symbionts, um, they sometimes don't have enough energy basically to keep them going, which can then in turn lead to them actually dying or them actually being dead. Um, when they're still bleached, they can go back to being healthy actually because when the symbionts get expelled into the water column, some of them are free living, which means they can still survive within the water column. And then corals after a while can actually take up the symbionts again, um, maybe sometimes the same or sometimes different symbionts. And then they can actually, um, yeah, become healthy again. But this can only happen when the reef isn't further stressed. When it's further stressed or when the bleaching is too severe, they will actually end up dead as here in the right picture where they're all overgrown by algae. And this process is not reversible. Over the past, we've seen a lot of mass bleaching and also global bleaching events. A mass bleaching event is when locally a reef or several reefs um, um, yeah, have a lot of bleaching. So like a lot of corals in these reefs bleach. A global bleaching event when, is when mass bleaching events occur over the whole globe. So um, in many, many different reefs across the planet. The first mass bleaching event was um, documented in the 1980s and the first global bleaching event was documented in 1998. Um, the next one followed in 2010 and then shortly after the third global bleaching event occurred in 2015. After that, we've seen a lot of mass bleaching events as for example, shown here on the right, um, and in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Um, 2016, 17 and 2020, there have been severe mass bleaching events. And we can see that the space between the bleaching events um, actually gets shorter and shorter. This is problematic because um, like I said before, when the reef is further stressed after a bleaching event or when it's, when it's bleached, um, it cannot go back to being healthy again. It will very likely end up dead. And this is further problematic because we've seen in the past um, that there have been mass extinction events, but after these, the recovery of biodiversity has actually taken hundreds of thousands to even millions of years. And this is a time frame we cannot even fathom. So to tie it all together, um, I've stressed how a warming ocean um, and also how ocean acidification 
um, will impact coral reefs due to climate change. There's different, um, there's also other stressors like sea level rise or changes in storm patterns, changes in precipitation or even altered ocean currents that occur due to climate change and that will also affect coral reefs in the future. So for example, if we look at uh, stronger or more frequent storms, they destruct the three dimensionality of, restructure of the reefs and this is, um, yeah, this is very problematic for them. Often they die or they cannot host as many species. And <clears throat> all these stressors and all these effects of, on coral reefs are, um, yeah, are very problematic because there's a lot of social and economic dependence on coral reefs in regions where there's coral reefs. As you can see here on this graph, um, most um, regions such as islands here in the Pacific that depend highly on coral reefs are those regions that are impacted most severely by climate change, as I've stressed before, um, but they are the ones that have actually not contributed at all or very little to climate change. Um, same is here in, the, in Central America, for example, or here in the Indian Ocean. And this is why climate change is a climate justice issue. Um, I hope I've been able to stress this enough. I hope I've been able to um, provide you with an overview why our oceans are so important when we look at climate change. Um, <clears throat> yes, and so um, this is basically it. I want to um, advertise a little bit for myself and a project that I have with a very good friend of mine. Um, we have a podcast. It's a marine science podcast. Unfortunately, it's only in German so far. Um, maybe at some point in the future, we'll have um, some English episodes. We'll see. Um, but either way, um, yeah, we're looking at everything related to marine science because we want to portray that when we, if we want to save our oceans, we have to know what's going on. We have to understand the processes within. Um, and so we look at the latest research topics. We look at different organisms of the seas. And we also um, yeah, have a lot of episodes that focus on climate change and on the impacts on different organisms or different ecosystems within our oceans. Um, if you are a German speaker, uh, you can listen to us on any platform. Um, we're called Die Drei Meerjungfrauen. Um, you can also follow us on Instagram or on Twitter. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention. Yeah, thanks a lot, Anna, for this presentation. It was amazing uh, to get to know um, how it's what is going on with our earth uh, at the moment. Uh, I decided that I go on in English now. Uh, if you have any questions, just ask them in, uh, in our chat via YouTube and tweet back uh, English or German. Uh, we're gonna make it dependent on which language it is. And we have one question from, uh, from tweet back. Uh, I would ask you and yeah, we are gonna know how it's going, what is going on with our earth now on this day. And what would you say, what can we do to save our oceans, especially uh, the coral reefs? Well, the one major thing that we need to do is address the CO2 problem. We need to um, work together globally, like politicians need to work together globally to tackle this problem. Um, we need to reduce our CO2 emissions as soon as possible. Um, there's many scenarios how this could go, but um, as Fridays for Future is uh, saying and has um, yeah, already even published how this could um, work in Germany, for example, that we need to be um, net zero by 2035. And this is, um, this is the only thing that we can do basically to save our corals because they're already dying as I've stressed before. Um, and for this, we need action. We need people to go onto the streets. We need people to pressure our politicians. Thanks a lot. Uh, now I'm gonna switch to German for the next question. Um, yeah, Anna, um, die Frage war noch, uh, warum uh, Meeresbiologie? Um, was treibt dich da an, warum das Thema? Nach dem Vortrag muss man da noch mehr sagen, würde ich jetzt noch hinterher schießen, aber gerne. <lacht> ähm, ja, das ist eine gute Frage. Also 
Äh, tatsächlich finde ich es ähm, immer wieder faszinierend, wie Menschen beispielsweise Biologie studieren und dann nicht in die Meeresbiologie gehen, weil ich persönlich ähm, Tiere und Pflanzen in unseren Ozeanen einfach am interessantesten finde. Also ich finde die deutlich interessanter, als was wir so an Land haben, auch wenn das auch total spannend ist alles. Ähm, ja, mich hat einfach immer, mich haben Ozeane immer in dem Sinne interessiert, als dass ähm, ja, ich das so spannend finde, wie schwierig es teilweise ist, sie zu erforschen. Ähm, aufgrund dessen, was ich vorhin schon gesagt habe, ähm, wie schwierig es ist, an einige Stellen ranzukommen, wie schwierig das ist, irgendwie einen großen Überblick darüber zu kriegen, wie viele Arten überhaupt ähm, in unseren Ozeanen leben. Davon, ja, wir wissen eigentlich noch gar nicht so viel, wie wir denken, dass wir wissen. Ähm, dadurch, dass es so unerforscht ist, hat es mich immer interessiert, ähm, mich interessiert, wie stark einfach alles miteinander zusammenhängt. Ähm, ja, und ich, also, ja, ich muss sagen, dass ich auch schon früher Korallenriffe einfach immer total spannend fand und das auch so ein bisschen einer der Gründe war, weshalb ich ähm, ja, mich dafür entschieden habe. Ja, sehr spannend. Ähm, wir haben nicht mehr super viel Zeit. Uh, if you have further questions, you can ask them uh, in the chat and we will answer them afterward. Um, so, I think the last question would be, um, or maybe I would give you the last minutes we have. Uh, if you want to talk about purpose, uh, another topic we can do um, to save the oceans. So uh, thanks a lot, Anna. We just have two minutes. If you want, you can say something at least. And thanks a lot for this presentation uh, to be part of the Public Climate School. Uh, I'm very, very happy about it. and. Yeah, to, to, to the audience uh, there on the outside, it's uh, gonna go on with the Klima for Acht uh, uh, at the next, at 19.50.50, and then the Klima Journal from us. So stay tuned. And Anna, I would give you the last uh, minutes we have. Thank you. Um, well, first I want to say thank you very much that I was able to present um, here. Uh, it's, I, I feel very honored, um, especially because, yes, I've also been a, a part of the organizing team for such a long time, and now I'm actually able to present. Um, it's a great honor. Um, I need to stress uh, even more what I said, that climate justice is the key here. Like, we really need to look into social justice. We, look, uh, we need to look into intersectionality when we try to tackle this problem. We cannot um, tackle this by the same, um, yeah, by the same processes that we've already, um, yeah, implemented. We, we cannot, um, yeah, we cannot go in the same way that we've, on the same path that we've already been on. We need to change this and we need to do this with looking into people that are most affected. Dann würde ich sagen, super Schlussworte, dann winken wir zum Schluss in die Kamera. Thanks a lot for being part and bye. Bye. Hey, du willst Teil der Bewegung werden und Klimabildung für alle voranbringen? Dann finde unter studentsforfuture.de deine Gruppe vor Ort oder Infos, wie du deutschlandweit aktiv werden kannst. Du bist kein Studi mehr? Kein Problem. Unter for-future-bündnis.de findest du deine passende For-Future-Gruppe.